Nick Price, Time Watch is in half an hour after we discover more family secrets in Blood Ties. Victorian Britain is great territory for the family historian. The 19th century love of statistics, exhaustive newspaper reports and a wealth of photographs are terrific source material, especially if you've got a public figure in the family. A chartered surveyor from Bognor Regis, Richard Jeffries, has spent 17 years researching his great-great-great-grandfather, a high-profile public servant with a difference. His story taps into that other great Victorian obsession, crime and punishment. As he ascended the steps leading to the drop, his limbs trembled under him, and he appeared scarcely able to move. Calcraft proceeded to place on his head the white nightcap and to adjust the fatal rope. I think it was Christmas 1960 it started when I was given a copy of the Guinness Book of Records and sometime thereafter my mother drew attention to us that one of the entries in there was in fact my great 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 grandfather William Calcraft and he was listed in there as the longest serving public executioner. The criminals turned their faces towards the crowd below. The drop fell and justice had its due. Husband and wife were in an instant, and almost without a struggle, launched into eternity. It was something that really lay dormant in my mind for quite a long time, in fact, till the early 1980s, when I finally decided I wanted to look into my family and particularly find out if the story of the hangman in the family was, was in fact a true story. I was living in Bristol at the time and I looked into reports of an execution there in 1849. The time of the execution had been brought forward to give him time to get to Norwich for the next execution on the following Saturday. He certainly travelled a lot by train and I've often sort of referred to his train travel as perhaps he was one of the earliest long distance rail commuters. When I first started to look into his career, one of the first discoveries I made was that during his period as an executioner, the Times newspaper in particular, as well as local newspapers, used to carry very good and often very detailed reports of executions. Over the years, I've compiled a list of some, I think it's over 900 executions during his period. Of those, I can place at least 300 or more into Calcraft's hands. Because Calcraft was a public figure, he featured in booklets and cartoons. And at the Taunton Record Office in Somerset, Richard Jeffries found a collection of letters between Calcraft and the governor of the local jail, detailing train times, fees, and even an expense claim for rope. It's actually given me the opportunity to put a lot of flesh onto the skeleton and to learn a lot about the person and, perhaps more importantly, a lot about where that person went and what he did. The hangman was very much a part-time job. He was employed by the city and paid a weekly wage, in fact, 21 shillings for doing that. But he was also a shoemaker. 
he must have had a very positive constitution, I suppose, to be able to regularly apply himself to a particularly grisly thing to be doing. Richard has travelled the country, visiting the prisons where his great-great-great-grandfather worked. Here at Bodmin Jail, Calcraft executed two men in 1856 and 1862. As well as compiling his master list of hangings, Richard is now something of an expert on the mechanics of the Victorian execution. Calcraft, the condemned prisoner, sometimes the prison governor, and the chaplain would have all come up onto the scaffold. At that point, he'd have positioned the condemned under the noose and put the noose around their neck, having strapped their hands. He would then usually place a cap over their head, and the chaplain would often be saying prayers, might be the burial service for the dead. At an appropriate point, Calcraft would have moved over to the lever to release the drop, and at that point, if everything worked, then the prisoner would fall and be hung. For the most part, hanging was simply uh, slow strangulation in a noose of rope. It was a slow, uh, painful, extremely distressing way of killing people. Calcraft became one of the first of the sort of um, publicly known public executioners, and thereafter it became a much more professional business. It's reported that Calcraft would go underneath and swing on the legs of the person to ensure that the hanging was successfully completed. People were dying in great agony in public, often being jeered on by a drunken crowd. And that wasn't a particularly edifying spectacle, and it certainly offended the uh, sensitivities of quite a number of people. On the whole, Victorian society by the 1860s said, look, this is pretty disgusting. You know, we really don't want it. Uh, so it was a remarkable time of transition of law reform and also of penal reform, of course. During the 19th century, 300 capital offences were gradually reduced to four, and in 1868, the Tory government finally abolished public hangings. The last public execution in England took place in May 1868 in Newgate and was carried out by Calcraft. The condemned prisoner on that occasion was a person by the name of Michael Barrett and it was in the August of 1868 that Calcraft was called on to carry out the first execution under the new regime where it was held within the confines of the prison. William Calcraft, shown here in his 60s, continued hanging people for another decade. Richard's fascination with his ancestor has become a permanent feature of family life. His children have got used to their holidays, featuring visits to prisons and cemeteries. They probably at times have felt that I, I've become a bit obsessed with the subject. What sort of views have you got as to what he did and what sort of a person perhaps he was? As I got older, I thought it was quite sad. I thought it was quite sick, yeah. <laughs> but there we go. I think it was a job, so he had to do it. It's like anything, it's a job, and he, yeah. it's what he was doing, and it really helped him earn his living. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, I think it was quite a disgusting job to do. It used to be quite scary when I was younger, because obviously... Yeah, I think it, I don't know if it's scary or it just... Plain embarrassing to have <laughs> friends around and it's like, oh, this is my dad and, oh, his hobby isn't fishing. No, 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 it's hangmen. It means murders. That's sort of slightly sordid. But if he'd just been a shoe, shoe mender, would we ever have found... We wouldn't have found him in the Guinness Book of Records, would we? No, and no, this is true. We wouldn't have found it, all the references to him in newspapers and other places. I guess it's an interesting talking point when you get to history at school and have to draw your family tree. And I'd say probably all of us and draw our family tree back a reasonable way. I guess it's made whole sort of history things seem slightly more worthwhile. It's brought it more alive, perhaps, hasn't it? He actually retired as a hangman in 1874, 
and he died some five years later, towards, I think it was the December of 1879. Richard's investigations have recently led him to discover William Calcraft's last resting place, the now disused and overgrown Abney Park Cemetery in North London. Well, this seems to be the family grave of William Calcraft and his wife, Louisa. Although it describes it as a family grave, it doesn't actually say if William himself was buried in this grave, rather surprisingly. Although from the inscription at the top where it says family grave of William Ong and Louisa Calcraft, I suspect that this is where he was buried. quite a sort of almost moving moment, sort of having been following William and his family over the years to actually be sitting here by, by this gravestone and realising that this is their final resting place and uh, it's set here in a rather quiet and, albeit overgrown, but rather peaceful setting which uh, make, makes it all a rather almost moving experience. I've been doing this now for some 17 or 18 years, and I suspect that I'll probably still be doing the same thing in another 17 or 18 years' time. Richard Jeffrey's tally of his ancestors' victims has now reached 325, industrious chap, and if you think any of your relatives may have fallen prey to the hangman's rope, here's a handy volume listing people executed in Britain between 1600 and 1909. Details on our website. But what if your ancestors weren't public figures and didn't even have a fixed address? What if they lived on narrow boats and were constantly on the move? The descendants of the barge people who made their living on canals like this one in Birmingham, family history is a sort of puzzle in time and space. From the start of the Industrial Revolution, right up to the 1930s, more than 100,000 people worked Britain's waterways. It was a tough life for those families, transporting iron and coal from one end of the country to the other. Until recently, no one thought you could trace the family history of people who were constantly on the move. Morning, Joe. Albert Harmon was brought up on a barge and is one of the last in a long line of boat people. He doesn't know much about his distant ancestors, but he has managed to trace his great-grandparents. I can actually got birth certificates of my granddad's dad and mum. And before that, I have them on the um, census record saying that they, the parents of both people as well, but I'm still tracing them. It's a lot of, I have to search the country for them. It isn't easy tracing your relatives when they're born in one place, registered in another. So it's, it's, a, it's been a long job. It was assumed that because the boat people were nomadic, they didn't register births, marriages or deaths. But Albert found that records do exist. This, this one here, I've done some chasing about this week over this one, because um, this is my mum's sister, one of my mum's sisters, her name was Lily. She was actually born on a canal boat called Fervin A Basin, Broad Street, Wolverhampton. And there's my granddad, John Davis, Jane Walt Jane Davis, formerly Walt Walters. They called him Joe Waters, Ginny Waters. And she was a canal company's boatman. They couldn't, the marker Jane Davis is a cross because he couldn't read and write. Albert's the first generation of his family to read and write. But he isn't alone in his search. As the records are so scattered, People tracing their canal boat ancestors have created an informal network. Collecting information on more than 40 canal boat families, Lorna York has a file for each one. Norman Holt, another researcher, collects and logs lists of boat people. We've brought Lorna and Norman to Albert's house in Birmingham to help add to his family history. Hello, Lord, are you? Yes, ah. <laughs> never, never, These three never, only never, know never. each other from swapping information over the phone. Until today, they'd never met. 
Always been just a voice on the phone. That's right. <laughs> Lovely I'm voice. The other voice You're on the, the other phone. Other voice on the phone. Uh, just Norman has been collecting the names of barge people for the last seven years. Many of them have come from parish registers. So far, he's logged nearly 5,000 of them on his computer. I was told by a lady in Wolverhampton I would never find many births and marriages because they didn't marry. And at the moment, I think we're on 4,500. Yeah, yes. Now, I'm connected to the internet, mm -hmm. and I send out about three emails a day about boat people, big files and little files. And this is one that went out, which you would like. That's the Davis oh, the file. Davis. Oh, the papers are about Albert's grandparents, the Davises. I, w I was asked once why I collected boat people. I collect them as if they were stamps. Yeah. I just collect boat people. Yeah. Lorna York has travelled the length and breadth of England in search of barge people who are related to her own family. She's managed to build up one of the most extensive collections in existence. This, the biggest file of all, is just for her own ancestors. When I started, I only knew my dad was born on the boat. And then I was reading a book and I found my grandparents. When Lorna first found this photo of the locks at Tring in Hertfordshire, she noticed the Richmond, which her aunt told her was her grandparents' boat. It gave her a precious image of her father's parents at home on their barge. One of these is my dad. Yeah. But I don't know which one, because no, yeah. I've never seen him as a child, you see. Yeah. You, you must have had some posh relatives, because they had a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found them on the 1881 census, right? Uh -huh. yes. They were tied up on a boat, the United Sisters at Gayton in Northamptonshire. But, you, but the census has its limitations when people are on the move. So Albert and Lorna have also used specialist records to track their forebears. And you go back again. Canal boat registration documents record the name of a particular boat and those who worked on it. Boats had to be registered by law following a Canal Boat Act in 1877. They're not like the census, they don't give you a, a place and a time as such, but they do give you an extra piece because they're not done at the same time as the census is. And you are capable of tracing the boats as they move around the country. I also wrote to Roy Jameson at the National Waterways Museum at Gloucester. Yeah. And he sent me this. I only got it yesterday, actually. Higgins. And it's a gauge register report. Gauge register reports are also valuable. Their purpose was to log the boat's cargo. But more importantly to the genealogist, they give the skipper's name. Yeah, you know the Higgins? Do you yeah. know the Higgins are related? Lorna, this is my record of the Higgins family. Look, you got William Higgins there, age 28, you see, and Boatman born in Oxford. Oxford again. That matches up exactly yeah. with yours, you see. And then I got right back to 1780, which is around about the beginnings of the canal. Canal, just to, in the. I then found. John Higgins. Emma Wenlock, married to John Higgins. At this point, Lorna and Albert discovered their records tallied. They're both related to the Higgins family. Through Norman here, he found it for me at St James, Horsley Field. And there's one connected to your Davises there. I know. It's, we, we're going to find out because... <laughs> so we've got to find we, we, out we're where We're getting that, closer yeah. together already, yeah. isn't it? When Lorna retires, she intends to start a Canal Boat Family History Society. Norman wants to pass on all his knowledge to a boat museum. But Albert wants to ensure his grandchildren remember their ancestors. I'm leaving a lot of knowledge and artefacts and collection behind for my grandchildren. I think it's not a bad thing to know what, what has gone behind you. I was actually working pushing gates when I was six, that's of his age. Did the mummies and daddies help? Oh yes, the, the, the mummies helped the daddies. The daddies was usually the master of the boat, they called him, or the skipper. And he was the one that got paid, and he had to provide his own crew. And in most cases, the crew was 
the mummy and the children. They didn't want to go and work in factories and be restricted and work in shops and everywhere else, and lot of them wasn't really suitable for working in what we call industry now. They was a community that understood each other, they knew, and they all mucked in together, and there was a camaraderie amongst both people, and they looked after each other. Lorna York certainly found the great census of the 19th century invaluable in her research. Here are a few tips on how to get the most out of a census. Modern censuses began in 1801 and were taken every 10 years, except in 1941, during the war. The first three are frankly pretty patchy, but the one in 1841 gives names, occupations and approximate age. And in 1851, you'll find precise age and place of birth. Now here's a tip. If your family's on the 1841 census, then always check the 51 census as well. If they hadn't moved, there may be more information about them on the later one. But a word of caution, people didn't always tell the truth. Of course, you normally need your ancestor's address to search a census. Unless it's the 1881 census, the most useful of all. That has an index which covers the whole of England and Wales. It's available on CD-ROM and it can be searched in a variety of ways. More information on our website. The last census which is fully available is the one for 1891. Unfortunately, a 100-year rule prevents general access to the later ones. So 2002 will be a big year for family historians. The 1901 census becomes available then. Happy searching. We have the Victorian love of paperwork to thank for many of our research tools, but it was their passion for photography which can really bring family history alive. And surprisingly, it wasn't just the preserve of the wealthy, even from the early days. But the older the photo, the harder it can be to identify the faces staring out at us. I've been to meet a woman who can help. As curator of Manchester's own collection, Audrey Linkman is an expert in dating photographs. She believes the conventions of Victorian paintings influenced photographic portraits. The whole purpose of a painted portrait was to idealise the sitter. And what photography did was to swallow these ideas almost lock, stock and barrel. So a calm, controlled expression, a formal, unsmiling expression, implied that you uh, had self-control, that you took yourself seriously and expected others to do likewise. It's the format of a photograph which can give the first clue about its age. The very earliest ones came in cases because they were so delicate. This is a daguerreotype. It comes onto the market 1841 and had disappeared by about 1855. One of the distinguishing features of the daguerreotype is that when you turn it in the light, sometimes it looks negative and sometimes, sometimes yeah, it... No, you can see that. Isn't yes, it? Yes. yes. Now, if you've got one of these in your family collection, the one thing you can be sure of is that your family were doing very nicely, thank you, at the time. But the daguerreotype was shoved off the commercial portrait market by new process, which is known as the collodion process, what appears like a glass negative to us. They come out initially about 1853, and they were quite expensive, but they were half the price of um, a daguerreotype. This was the um, standard article of commerce on the high street in the 1850s. And what came next? Well, after that, these were shoved out of the high street by this, the so-called carte visite, paper print of a standard size and a card mount of a standard size and this comes into Britain in 1860. Mm, that would fit in better. So you may be able to pin down a date but what about identifying the people in the photograph? Audrey holds a surgery for family historians eager to put names to faces. Joan Platt, a retired teacher from Merseyside, thought she'd found a school photograph of her aunt. In fact, the group portrait comes into its own really in the 1880s when you get the uh, dry plate photography, mm. the gelatin dry plate. So what but date I think was this that? Is, I think this is 1870s. Oh, uh, so it's uh, not going to be who I thought it was. So I thought it was my aunt who was only born to the school photo, 1870s. Maybe 1880s. In this case, the date of the photograph doesn't tie in with the age Joan's aunt would have been at the time. 
information. For sisters Norma and Dorinda, Audrey was able to shed some light on what seemed to be just an ordinary portrait. What do you notice about that one? Well, her hand is obvious, isn't it? And yeah, what's obviously on her hand that we're all meant to take? I presume she's got a ring in my contact. Oh, can't you see that? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> no <laughs> accident. <laughs> this pose has been assumed. Yes. And what yes, she's what? showing off? She is showing off yes. her ring. So a photograph like this can either be her engagement photo or indeed it can be her wedding photo. If you have a photograph that you can say is a wedding portrait, if you have the photographer's name on the back, say it was Liverpool, and if I can give you some guide to the dating, so you know it was taken in 1890, you might, if you're very lucky, begin to get some idea of who this might be. The woman's identity remains a mystery, but Norma and Dorinda now know that a wedding took place in the family in the 1870s and are a step closer to finding out who the bride is. What is it you enjoy so much by having people show you their albums? Well, I learn from them. And sometimes I see photographs that are quite untypical. They buck the trend. And they're the exciting ones because you want to find the explanation behind the taking of that photograph. My mother asked my grandmother before she died who they were. And she said they were my grandfather's grandparents. So he dies in 1865 and she in 1881. I thought the fashion might have been right, you know. They disturb me enormously. Because I think the original photograph would have been taken 1860. Mm -hmm. But the mount and everything um, is much later. When did you say died? 1865. Right. Well, the original of this, I think, was an 1860s carte de visite. That they've enlarged or something. That they have subsequently uh -huh. enlarged. But the normal time that you do that is when they die. So why? But this must have been done a long time later because these mounts are turn of the century mounts oh. right yeah. audrey's been able to show joan that someone in her family cared for her great great grandparents enough to have photographs of them enlarged some 40 years after their death this is an interesting one because i think this is this little boy's breaching photograph um the victorians went to the studio to celebrate special occasions in their their lives and breaching was a rite of passage. Little boys were put into their first pair of short trousers. And um, lots of photographs in the family album show these breaching portraits. Because they used to wear dresses before that, didn't yes. they? That's right. So, for example, with this one next to it, I wouldn't be quite sure which it was. No. Was a little boy or a little girl? No. Would you? No. 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 A look at the back of the photograph reveals that it is a boy. What are the, the rarest photographs do you think you might come across? Well, I think without a doubt, the post-mortem portrait. I have a particular fondness for these. What would happen is that relatives would ask the photographer um, to attend at the home, and the photographer attempted to represent the dead as if sleeping, and they were meant to console the grieving relative. And I think that is how they should be read, and I find them very beautiful indeed. So can you predict what's going to come through the door of your office? To some extent, but you can't do it totally, and that's what makes it exciting. Next week, two strong women. We're off to Wardour Castle with a descendant of Lady Arundel, who held the Roundheads at bay for six days. And we're on the trail of the Amazon of the Tamar, a champion rower from Cornwall who spawned a whole generation of gig racers. See you then. Our website has a guide to researching your family history and a feature on Victorian photographs. If you've got a story to share with us, you can email us there.